Chapter Twenty Two of April's Lady. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford. Chapter Twenty Two so over violent or over civil a man so various dull looking day says dicky brown looking up from his broiled kidney to glare indignantly through the window at the gray sky it can't be always may says beauclerk cheerfully whose point it is to take ever a lenient view of things even to heaven itself he is kind and holds out a helping hand i expect it is we ourselves who are dull says lady baltimore looking round the breakfast table where now many vacant seats make the edges bare yesterday morning miss maliphant left to-day the clontarfs and one or two strange men from the barracks in the next town desertion indeed seems to be the order of the day we grow very small says she how i miss people when they go away do you mean that as a liberal bribe for the getting rid of the rest of us says dicky who is now devoting himself to the hot scones if so let me tell you it isn't good enough i shall stay here until you choose to cross the channel i don't want to be missed that will be next week says lady baltimore i do beseech all here present not to forsake me until then i must deny your prayer said lady swansdon these tiresome lawyers of mine say they must see me on thursday at the latest i shall meet you in town at christmas however says lady baltimore making the remark a question i hardly think so i have promised the bearings to join them in italy about then well here then in february lady swansdon smiles at her hostess but makes no audible reply i suppose we ought to do something to-day says lady baltimore presently in a listless tone it is plain to everybody however that in reality she wants to do nothing suggest something dicky skittles says that youth without hesitation very promptly however no one takes any notice of him i was thinking that if we went to corner cross it would be a nice drive says lady baltimore still struggling with her duties as a hostess what do you say beatrice i pray you excuse me says lady swanston as i leave to-morrow i must give the afternoon to the answering of several letters and to other things besides corners cross said joyce idly i've so often heard of it yet oddly enough i have never seen it it is always the way isn't it whenever one lives very close to some celebrated spot celebrated or not it is at least lovely says lady baltimore you really ought to see it i'll drive you there this afternoon miss kavanagh says beauclerk in his friendly way that in public has never a tincture of tenderness about it we might start after luncheon it is only about ten miles off eh to baltimore ten briefly i am right then equally we might easily do it in little over an hour an hour and a half with best horse in the stables bad road says baltimore even so we shall get there and back in excellent time says beauclerk deaf to his brother-in-law's gruffness will you come miss kavanagh i should like it says joyce in a hesitating sort of way but then why not go dear says lady baltimore kindly the moreaus of craigston live not half a mile from it 
and they will give you tea if you feel tired norman is a very good whip and will be sure to have you back here in proper time dysart lifting his head looks full at joyce at that rate says she smiling at beauclerk it is settled then says beauclerk pleasantly thank you ever so much for helping me to get rid of my afternoon in so delightful a fashion it is going to rain it will be a wet evening says dysart abruptly oh my dear fellow you can hardly be called a weather prophet says beauclerk batteringly you ought to know that a settled gray sky like that seldom means rain no more is said about it then and no mention is made of it at luncheon at half-past two precisely however a dog-cart comes round to the hall door joyce running lightly downstairs habited for a drive meets dysart at the foot of the staircase do not go says he abruptly not go now with a glance at her costume i didn't believe you would go says he vehemently i didn't believe it possible or i should have spoken sooner nevertheless at this last moment i entreat you to give it up impossible she said curtly annoyed by his tone which is perhaps unconscientiously a little dictatorial you refuse me it is not the question i have said i would go i see no reason for not going i decline to make myself foolish in the eyes of everybody by drawing back at the last moment you have forgotten everything then i don't know coldly that there is anything to remember oh bitterly not so far as i am concerned i count for nothing i allow that but he i fancied you had at least read him i think perhaps there was nothing to read says she lowering her eyes if you can think that it is useless my saying anything further he moves to one side as if to let her pass but she hesitates perhaps she would have said something to soften her decision but a rare thing with him he loses his temper seeing her standing there before him so sweet so lovely so indifferent as he tells himself his despair overcomes him i have a voice in this matter says he frowning heavily i forbid you to go with that fellow a sharp change crosses mrs kavanagh's face all of the sudden softness dies out of it she stoops leisurely and disengaging the end of the black lace round her throat from an envious banister that would have detained her without further glance or word for dysart she goes up the hall and through the open doorway beauclerk who has been waiting for her outside comes forward a little spring seats her in the cart beauclerk jumps in beside her another moment sees them out of sight the vagrant sun that all day long had been coming and going in fitful fashion has suddenly sunk behind the thunderous gray cloud that rising from the sea now spreads itself o'er hill and vale the light has died out of the sky dull muttering sounds come rumbling down from the distant mountains the vast expanse of barren log upon the left has become almost obscure here and there a glint of its watery waste may be seen but indistinctly giving the eye a mournful impression of lands forlorn a strange hot quiet seems to have fallen upon the trembling earth we often see against some storm a silence in the heavens the rack stands still the bold wind speechless and the orb below is hushed as death just now that boding silence reigns a sense of fear falls on joyce she scarcely knows why 
as her companion with a quick lash of the whip urges the horse up the steep hill they are still several miles from their destination and though it is only four o'clock it is no longer day the heavens are black as ink the trees are shivering in expectant misery what is it says joyce and even as she asks the question it is answered the storm is upon them in all its fury all at once without an instant's warning a violent downpour of rain comes from the bursting clouds threatening to deluge them we are in for it says beauclerk in a sharp short tone so unlike his usual dulcet accents that even now in her sudden discomfort it startles her the rain is descending in torrents a wild wind has arisen the light has faded and now the day resembles nothing so much as the dull beginning of a winter's night have you any idea where we are asked barclerk presently none you know i told you i had never been here before but you you must have some knowledge of it how should i these detestable irish isolations are as yet unknown paths to me but i thought you said you gave me the impression that you knew connor's cross i regret it if i did shortly the rain is running down his neck by this time leaving a cold drenched collar to add zest to his rising ill temper i had heard of connor's cross i never saw it i devoutly hope with a snarl i never shall i don't think you are likely to says joyce whose own temper is beginning to be ruffled well this is a cell says beauclerk he is buttoning up a heavy ulster round his handsome form he is very particular about the fastening of the last button that one that goes under the chin and having satisfactorily accomplished it and found by a carefully moving backward and forward of his head that it is comfortably adjusted it occurs to him to see if his companion is weatherproof got wraps enough asks he no by jove here put on this dragging a warm cloak of her own from under the seat and offering it to her with the air of one making a gift what is it coat cloak ulster one never knows what woman's clothes are meant for to cover them says joyce calmly well put it on by jove how it pours all right now having carelessly flung it round her without regard for where her arms ought to go through the sleeves think you can manage the rest by yourself so beastly difficult to do anything in a storm like this with this brute tugging at the reins and the rain running up one sleeve i can manage it very well myself thank you says joyce giving up the finding of the sleeves as a bad job after a futile effort to discover their whereabouts she buttons the cloak across her chest and sits beside him silent but shivering a little swift wandering thought of dysart makes her feel even colder if he had been there would she be thus roughly entreated nay rather would she not have been a mark for tenderest care a precious charge entrusted to his keeping a thing beloved and therefore to be cherished look there says she suddenly lifting her head and pointing a little to the right surely even through this denseness i see lights is it a village yes a village i should say grimly a hamlet rather would you ungraciously suggest our seeking shelter there i think it must be the village called falling says she too pleased at her discovery to care about his gruffness and if so the owner of the inn there was an old servant of my father's 
she often comes over to see barbara and the children and though i have never come here to see her i know she lives somewhere in this part of the world a good creature she is the kindest of women an inn says beauclerk deaf to the virtues of the old servant the innkeeper but altogether alive to the fact that she keeps an inn what a blessed oasis in our wilderness and it can't be more than half a mile away why recovering his usual delightful manner we shall find ourselves housed in no time i do hope my dear girl you are comfortable wrapped up to the chin eh quite right quite right after all the poor driver has the worst of it he must face the elements whatever happens now you with your dear little chin so cosily hidden from the wind and rain and with hardly a suspicion of the blast i am fighting making a charming picture really charming ah you girls you have the best of it beyond doubt and why not it is the law of nature weak women and strong men you know those exquisite lines can't that horse go faster says miss kavanagh breaking in on this little speech in a rather ruthless manner lapped in luxury as you evidently believe me i still assure you i should gladly exchange my present condition for a good wholesome kitchen fire always practical your charm one of them says mr beauclerk but he takes the hint nevertheless and presently they draw up before a small dingy place of shelter not a man is to be seen the village a collection of fifty houses when all is told is swept and garnished a few geese are strike are stalking up the street uttering creaking noises some ducks are swimming in a glad astonishment down the muddy streams running by the edges of the curbstones such a delicious wealth of filthy water has not been seen in falling for the past three dry months the deserted village with a vengeance says beauclerk he has risen in his seat and placed his whip in the stand with a view of descending and arousing the inhabitants of this sleepy hollow when a shock head is thrust out of the inn hotel rather as is painted on a huge sign over the door and being instantly withdrawn again with a muttered out ya ya is followed by a shriek for miss connolly miss connolly ma'am sure tis yourself that's wanted come down i tell ye there's genthry at the door and the rain pelting on em like the divil come down i'm telling ye or figs they'll go on to patty sheenan's and then will ye be o oh, murder where are ye at all at all tis ruin ye'll ne be entirely wid the staying of ye arrah hood ye wished ye old man the world says another voice and in a second a big buxom jolly hearty looking woman appears on the threshold peering a little suspiciously through the gathering gloom at the dog-cart outside first she catches sight of the crest and coronet and a gleam of pleased intelligence brightens her face then lifting her eyes she meets those of joyce and the sudden pleasure gives way to actual and honest joy it is miss connolly says joyce in a voice that is supposed to accompany a smile but has in reality something of tears in it miss connolly regardless of the pelting rain and her best cap takes a step forward End of chapter 22 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 23 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 23 All is not gold that outward sheweth bright. I love everything that's old. Old friends, old times, old manners, old books, old wine. And it's you, Miss Joyce. Glory be! What a day to be out! Tis drenched ye are, entirely. Oh, come in, my dear, come in, me darlin. Here, Mikey, Patty, Jerry, come here. Every mother's son o oh, ye, and take Mr. Beauclerk's horse from him. Oh, by the laws, but ye are soaked, ar. What misfortune drove ye out to-day, of all days, Miss Joyce? Was there never a man to tell ye that twould be pelting storm before nightfall? There had been one. How earnestly Miss Cavanagh now wishes she had listened to his warning. It looked so fine two hours ago, said she, clambering down from the dog cart with such misguided help from the ardent Mrs. Connolly as almost lands her with the ducks in the muddy stream below. Ouch! There's no more dependence to be placed upon the weather than there is upon a man. However, tis welcome you are any way. Your father's daughter is dear to me. Yes, come this way, up these stairs. Tis Anne Connolly is proud to be entertaining one your blood inside their door. Oh, I'm so glad I found you, says Joyce turning when she has reached mrs connolly's bedroom to imprint upon that buxom widow's cheek a warm kiss it was a long way here long and so cold and wet and where were you goin at all if i may ask says mrs connolly taking off the girl's dripping outer garments to see connor's cross faith twas little ye had to do a musty old tomb like that with nothing but broken stones around it wouldn't the brand new graveyard below there do ye musha but tis quar the ginthry is ouch my dear twas wet ye are there isn't a dry stitch on ye i don't think i'm wet once my coats are off says joyce and indeed when those invaluable wraps are removed it is proved beyond doubt even mrs connolly's doubt which is strong that her gown is quite dry you see it was such a sudden rain says joyce and fortunately we saw the lights in this village almost immediately after it began figs too sudden it to be pleasant says mrs connolly twas well the early darkness made us light up so quickly or ye might have missed us, not knowing your road, and how's all with ye, my dear, Miss Barbara, and the master, and the darlin' children. I've a branny cock and a hen that I'm thinkin' of takin' down to Master Tommy this two weeks, but the old mare is mighty queer on her legs o' late. Are ye all well? quite well thank you mrs connolly wish ya god keep ya so and how are all of you when did you hear from america last month then divil a less and the greatest news of all a letter from johnny me eldest boy wid a five pound note in it and a picture of the girl he's gone to marry I declare to ye when that letter came, I just fell into a chair and tucked to laughin' and cryin' till that ouchel of a girl in the kitchen began to bait me on the back, thinking I was bad in a fit. To think, my dear, of little Johnine I used to nurse on me knee, thinkin' of takin' a partner. 
and a strappin fine girl too figs with cheeks like turnips but there now i'll show her to ye by and by she's a rale beauty if them portraits be true but there's a lot o lies coming from o'er the water and what ye be taken now miss joyce dear with a return to her hospitable mood a drop o hot punch now whisky is the finest thing out for givin the good bye to the cold oh no thank you miss connolly hastily if i might have a cup of tea i arrah bad cess to that tay what's the good of it at all at all to a frozen stomach could poison i calls it well there and come along down with me now and give yourself to the entertainment of mr beauclerk whilst i wet the pot glory what a man he is the size o the house a fine man in earnest tell me now with a shrewd glance at joyce is there anything betwixt you and him nothing says joyce surprised even herself by the amount of vehement denial she throws into this word oh well there's others and mr dysart would be more to my fancy there's a nate man if you like me be figs with a second half sly wholly kindly glance at the girl if twas he now i give ye a blessin with a heart and a half and indeed now miss joyce tis time ye were thinking o settlin well i'm not thinking of it this time says joyce laughing though a little catch in her throat warns her she is not far from tears perhaps mrs connolly hears that little catch too for she instantly changes her tactics faith ain't tis right ye are my dear there's a deal o trouble in marriage and ain't tis young to entirely to undertake the likes of it says she veering round with a scandalous disregard for appearances my what hair ye have miss joyce tis improved it is even since last i saw ye i'm a great admirer of a good head o hair i wonder when the rain will be over asked joyce wistfully gazing through the small window at the threatening heavens if it's my opinion you're askin says mrs connolly i'd say not till tomorrow mornin oh mrs connolly turning a distressed face to that good creature well my dear what can i say but what i think flinging out her ample arms in self-justification would ye have me lie to ye why a sky like that always here a loud crash of thunder almost shakes the small inn to its foundations the heavens be good to us says mrs connolly crossing herself devoutly did ye ever hear the like of that but it can't last it is impossible says joyce vehemently is there no covered car in the town couldn't a man be persuaded to drive me home if i promised him to if ye promised him a king's ransom ye couldn't get a covered car to-night said mrs connolly there's only one in the place and that belongs to mike murphy and tis off now miles bin skibbereen attending the funeral o father john mcguire twon't be home till to-morrow anyway and facts i wouldn't wonder if it wasn't here then for every mother's son at that wake will be as drunk as fiddlers to-night father john ye know me dear was greatly respected are you sure there isn't another car quite positive but why ye need be so uneasy miss joyce dear sure tis safe and ye're sure you're wid with me but what will they think at home and at the court 
says joyce faltering are what can they think miss but that the rain was altogether too masterful for ye ye know my dear we can't even the best of us control the elements this unconvertible fact miss conley gives forth with a truly noble air of resignation come down now and let me get ye the paltry cup of tea you're craving for she leads joyce downstairs and into a snug little parlour with a roaring fire that is not altogether unacceptable this dreary evening the smell of stale tobacco smoke that pervades it is a drawback but if you think of it we can't have everything in this world perhaps joyce has more than she wants it occurs to her as beauclerk turns round from the solitary window that she could well have dispensed with his society that lurking distrust of him she had known vaguely but kept under during all their acquaintance has taken a permanent place in her mind during her drive with him this afternoon oh here you are beastly smoky hole he says taking no notice of miss connolly who is doing her best curtsy in the doorway i think it looks very comfortable says joyce with a gracious smile at her hostess and a certain sore feeling at her heart once again her thoughts fly to dysart would that have been his first remark when she appeared after so severe a wedding tis just what i've been saying to miss kavanagh sir says mrs connolly with unabated good humour the heavens above is always too much for us we can't turn off the weather up there as we can the cock in the kitchen sink still there's compensations always glory be and what will ye please have with your tea miss turning to joyce with great respect in look and tone in spite of all her familiarity with her upstairs she now with a looker-on proceeds to treat her young lady as though she were a stranger and of blood royal anything you have miss conley says joyce only don't be long there is undoubted entreaty in the request mrs conley glancing at her concludes it is not so much a desire for what will be brought as for the bringer that animates the speaker give me five minutes miss and i'll be back again says she pleasantly leaving the room she stands in the passage outside for a moment and solemnly moves her kindly head from side to side it takes her but a little time to make up her shrewd irish mind on several points while this worthy person is getting you your tea i think i'll take a look at the weather from outside says mr beauclerk turning to joyce it is evident he is eager to avoid a tete a tete but this does not occur to her yes do do says she nevertheless with such a liberal encouragement as puzzles him women are kittle cattle however he tells himself better not to question their motives too closely or you will find yourself in queer street he gets to the door with a cheerful assumption of going to study the heavens that conceals his desire for a cigar and a brandy and soda but on the threshold joyce speaks again is there no chance would it not be possible to get home says she in a tone that trembles with nervous longing i'm afraid not i'm just going to see it is impossible weather for you to be out in but you it is clearing a little isn't it with a despairing glance out of the window if you could manage to get back and tell them that she is made thoroughly ashamed of her selfishness a moment later but my dear girl consider why should i tempt a severe attack of inflammation of the lungs by driving ten or twelve miles through this unrelenting torrent we are very well out 
of it here this miss er connor conley seems a very respectable person and is known to you i shall tell her to make you as comfortable as her limited liabilities with quite a laugh at his own wit will allow pray tell her nothing do not give yourself so much trouble says joyce calmly she will do the best she can for me without in the intervention of any one as you will au revoir says he waving her a graceful farewell for the moment he is not entirely happy in his mind as he crosses the tiny hall and makes his way first to the bar and afterward to the open doorway like a cat he hates rain to drive back through this turmoil of wind and wet for twelve long miles to the court is more than his pleasure loving nature can bear to look upon yet to remain has its drawbacks too if miss maliphant for example were to hear of this escapade there might be trouble there he has not as yet finally made up his mind to give inclination the go by and surrender himself to sordid considerations but there can be no doubt that the sordid things of this life have with some natures a charm hardly to be rivalled successfully by mere beauty the heiress is attractive in one sense joyce equally so in another miss maliphant's charms are golden are not joyce's more golden still and yet to give up miss maliphant to break with her finally to throw away deliberately a good ten thousand pounds a year he lights his cigar with an untrembling hand and having found it satisfactory permits his mind to continue its investigations ten thousand pounds a year a great help to a man yet he is glad at this moment that he is free to accept or reject it nothing definite has been said to the heiress nothing definite to joyce either it strikes him at this moment as he stands in the dingy doorway of the inn and stares out at the descending rain that he has shown distinct cleverness in the way in which he has manoeuvred these two girls without either of them feeling the least suspicion of the other last night joyce had been on the point of a discovery but he had smoothed away all that evidently he was born to be a successful diplomat and if that appointment he had been looking for ever comes his way he will be able to show the world a thing or two how charming that little girl in there can look and never more so than when she allows her temper to overcome her she had been angry just now yes but he can read between the lines angry naturally that he has not come to the point declared himself proposed as the saying is while puffing contemplatively at his cigar she must wait she must wait if the appointment comes off if sir alexander stands to him she has a very good chance but if that falls through why then and it won't do to encourage her too much by jove if miss maliphant were to hear of this evening's adventure she is headstrong solid enough to mark out a line for herself and fling him aside without waiting for judge or jury much it might cost her she would not hesitate to break all ties with him and any that existed were very slight he himself had kept them so perhaps after all he had better order the trap round leaving miss kavanagh here and and yet to go out in that rain to feel it beating against his face for two or three intolerable hours was anything even ten thousand pounds a year worth that he would be a drowned rat by the time he reached the court and after all couldn't it be arranged without all this bother 
he might easily explain it all away to miss maliphant even should some kind friend tell her of it that was his role he had quite a talent for explaining away but he must also make joyce thoroughly understand she was a sensible girl a word to her would be sufficient just a word to show that marriage at present was out of the question nothing unpleasant nothing finite but just some little thing to waken her to the true state of the case girls as a rule were sentimental and would expect much of an adventure such as this but joyce was proud he liked that in her there would be no trouble she would quite understand tea is coming up sor said a rough voice behind him the mistress told me to tell ye so the red-headed abigail who tends on mrs conley beckons him with a grimy forefinger to the repast within he accepts the invitation end of chapter twenty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty four of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter twenty four it is the mind that maketh good or ill that maketh wretch or happy rich or poor as he enters the inn parlor he finds joyce sitting by the fire listening to mrs connolly who armed with a large tray is advancing up the room toward the table nobody but the mistress herself is allowed to wait upon the young lady and i hope miss joyce twill be your liking and sorry i am sir with a courteous recognition of beauclerk's entrance that tis only one poor fowl i can give ye but them commercial travellers are the divil they lave nothing behind em if they could help it still miss with a loving smile at joyce i do think ye'll like the ham tis my own curin and i bought ye just a taste o this year's honey ye always a sweet tooth from the time ye were born i hardly have i could hardly have a sweet tooth before that says joyce laughing oh thank you mrs conley it is a lovely tea and it is very good of you to take all this trouble who'd be welcome to any trouble if twasn't yourself miss says mrs conley bowing and retreating toward the door a movement on the part of joyce checks her the girl has made an impulsive step as if to follow her and now seeing mrs conley stop short holds out to her one hand but mrs conley says she trying to speak naturally and succeeding very well so far as careless ears are in question but the mistress marks with a false note you will stay and pour out tea for us you will there is an extreme treaty in her tone the stronger in that it has to be suppressed mrs conley halting midway between the table and the door with the tray in her hands hears it and a sudden light comes not only in her eyes but her mind why if you wish it miss says she directly she lays down the tray standing it up against the wall and coming back to the table lifts the teapot and begins to fill the cups ye take sugar sir asks she of beauclerk who is a little puzzled but not altogether displeased at the turn affairs have taken after all as he has told himself a thousand times joyce is a clever girl she is determined not to betray the anxiety for his society that beyond question she is feeling and this prudence on her part 
will relieve him of many small embarrassments truly she is a girl not to be found every day he is accordingly most gracious to mrs conley praises her ham extols her tea says wonderful things about the chicken when tea is at an end he rises gracefully and expresses his desire to smoke one more cigar and have a last look at the weather you will be able to put us up says he oh yes sir sure he smiles beautifully and with a benevolent request to joyce to take care of herself in his absence leaves the room he's a dale o talk says mrs conley the moment his back is turned she is now sure that joyce has some private grudge against him or at all events is not what she herself would call partial to him yes says joyce he is very conversational how it rains still yes it does says mrs conley comfortably she is not at all put out by the girl's reserved manner having lived among the ginthry for many years and being well up to their queer ways a thought however that had been formulating in her mind for a long time past ever since indeed she found her young lady could not return home until morning now compels her to give the conversation a fresh turn i've got to apologize to ye miss but since ye must stay the night wid me i'm bound to tell ye i have no room for ye but a little one leadin out to me own are you so very full then mrs conley i'm glad to hear that for your sake full to the chin my dear thim commercials always drop down upon one just when last wanted then i suppose i ought to be thankful that you can give me a room at all says joyce laughing i'm afraid i shall be a great trouble to you ne'er a scrap in my life my dear twist proud i am to be of any service to ye and perhaps twill make ye easier in your mind to know as you're under my protection and that no gossip can come nee ye the good woman means well but she has flown rather above joyce's head or rather under her feet i'm delighted to be with you says miss kavanagh with a pretty smile but as for protection well the land leaguers round here are not so bad as the one should fear for one's life in a quiet village like this there's worse than land leaguers says mrs Connolly. there's them who talk talk of what says joyce a little vaguely well now my dear sure you haven't lived so long without knowing there's cruel people in the world said mrs conley anxiously and the fact you o goin out drivin with mr beauclerk and staying out the night with him might give rise to the talk i'm fightin again don't be angry with me now miss joyce and don't fret but tis as well to prepare ye joyce's heart as she listens seems to die with her a kind of sick feeling renders her speechless she had never thought of that of the idea of impropriety being suggested as part of this most unlucky escapade mrs conley noting the girl's white face feels as though she ought to have cut her tongue out rather than have spoken yet she had done all for the best miss joyce don't think about it says she hurriedly i'm sorry i said a word but and after all i'm right my dear tis better for ye when evil tongues are waggin to have a real friend like me to your back to say the needful word ye sleep with me to-night and i'll take ye back to her ladyship in the morning and never leave ye till i see ye in safe hands once more if ye liked him pointing to the door through which beauclerk had gone i'd say nothing for then all would come right enough but as it is 
I'll take it on myself to be the nurse to ye now that I was when ye were a little creature creeping along the floor. Joyce smiles at her, but rather faintly. A sense of terror is oppressing her. Lady Baltimore, what will she think? And Freddy and Barbara, they will all be angry with her. Oh, more than angry, they will think she has done something that other girls would not have done. How is she to face them again? The entire party at the court seems to spread itself before her. Lady Swanston and Lord Baltimore, they will laugh about it, and the others will laugh and whisper and... Felix, Felix Dysart, what will he think? What is he thinking now? To follow out this thought is intolerable to her. She rises abruptly. What o'clock is it, Mrs. Conley? says she in a hard strained voice i am tired i should like to go to bed now just eight miss anne if you're tired there's nothing like the bed you will like to say good night to mr beauclerk oh no no with frowning sharpness then recovering herself i need not disturb him you will tell him that i was chilled tired i'll tell him all that he ought to know said mrs conley come miss joyce everything is ready for ye and a lie down and a good sleep will be making of ye before morning joyce to her surprise is led through a very well appointed chamber evidently unused to a smaller but scarcely less carefully arranged apartment beyond the first is so plainly a room not in daily use that she turns involuntarily to her companion is this your room miss connolly for the night me dear says that excellent woman mysteriously you have changed your room to suit me you mean something says the girl growing crimson and feeling as if her heart was going to burst what is it no no miss no indeed confusedly but miss joyce i'll say this that tis eight year now since mr monkton came here and many's the good turn he's done me since he's been my lord's agent and that's nothing at all miss to the gratitude i bear toward your poor father the old head of the house and ye think when occasion comes i wouldn't stand up and do the best i could for one o year blood figs i'll take care that it won't be in the power of any one to say a word again you against me you're young miss but there's people old enough to have sense and charity as haven't it i can see ye couldn't go home to-night through that rain through i'm not saying a little spitfully but that he might have managed it still faith twas bad travelling for man or beast with a view to softening down her real opinion of beauclerk's behaviour how can she condemn him safely is he not my lady's own brother is he not my lord the owner of the very ground on which the inn is built of the farm a mile away where her cows are chewing the cud by this time in peace and safety you have changed your room to oblige me says joyce still with that strange miserable look in her eyes don't think about that miss joyce now and don't fret yourself about anything else either you're sure you can remember that i'm to your back always she bridles and draws up her ample figure to its fullest height looking at her it might suggest itself to any reasonable being that even the forlornest damsel with any such noble support might well defy the world but joyce is not to be so easily consoled what is support to her who can console a torn heart the day has been too eventful it has overcome her courage not only has she lost faith in her own power 
to face the angry authorities at home she has lost faith too in one whom against her judgment she has given more of her thoughts than was wise the fact that she had recovered from that folly does not render the memory of the recovery less painful the awakening from a troubled dream is full of anguish rising from a sleepless bed she goes down next morning to find mrs connolly standing on the lowest step of the stairs as if awaiting her booted and spurred for the journey i told him to order the trap early my dear for i knew ye'd be anxious says the kind woman squeezing her hand and now with an anxious glance at her i hope ye ate your breakfast i guess ye'd like it in your room so i sent it up to ye well come on dear mr beauclerk is outside waitin i explained it all to him said ye were tired you know and eager to get back so all's ready and the horse impatient in spite of the storm yesterday that seemed to shake earth and heaven to-day is beautiful soft glistening stains are rising from the early hill and bog and valley as the hot sun's rays beat upon them the world seems wrapped in one vast vaporous mist most lovely to behold all the woodland flowers are holding up their heads again after their past smitting from the cruel rain the trees are swaying to and fro in the fresh morning breeze thousands of glittering drops brightening the air as they swing themselves from side to side all things speak of a new birth a resurrection a joyful wakening from a terrifying past the grass looks greener for its bath all dust is laid quite low the very lichens on the walls as they drive past them look washed and glorified the sun is flooding the sky with gorgeous light there are sweet smells all round the birds in the woods on either side of the roadway are singing high chords in praise of this glorious day all nature seems joyous joyce alone is silent unappreciative unhappy the nearer she gets to the court the more perturbed she grows in mind how will they receive her there barbara had said that lady baltimore would not be likely to encourage an attachment between her and beauclerk and now though the attachment is impossible what will she think of this unfortunate adventure she is so depressed that speech seems impossible to her and all to mr beauclerk's sallies she scarcely returns an answer his sallies are many never has he appeared in grayer spirits the fact that the girl beside him is unmistakably low spirits has either escaped him or he has decided on taking no notice of it last night over that final cigar he had made up his mind that it would be wise to say to her some little thing that would unmistakably awaken her to the fact that there was nothing between him and her of any serious importance now having covered half the distance that lies between them and the court he feels will be a good time to say that little thing she is too distrait to please him she is evidently brooding over something if she thinks better crush all such hopes at once i wonder what they are thinking about us at home he says presently with quite a cheerful laugh suggestive of amusement no answer i dare say with a second edition of the laugh full now of wider amusement as though the comical fancy that has caught hold of him has grown to completion i shouldn't wonder indeed if they were thinking we had eloped this graceful speech he makes with the easiest air in the world they may be thinking you have eloped certainly says miss kavanagh calmly one's own people as a rule know one very thoroughly and are quite alive to one's little failings but that they should think it of me is quite out of the question well 
after all, I dare say you are right. I don't suppose it lies in the possibilities. They could hardly think it of me either, says Beauclerk, with a careless yawn, so extraordinary careless indeed as to be worthy of note. I'm too poor for amusement of that kind. One couldn't be too poor for that kind of amusement, surely. Romance and history have both taught us that it is only the impecunious who ever indulge in that folly. I am not so learned as you are, but, well, I'm an impecunious one. In all conscience, I couldn't carry it out. I only wish, tenderly, I could. With whom? icily as she asks the question she turns deliberately and looks him steadily in the eyes something in her regard disconcerts him and compels him to think that the following up of the little thing is likely to prove difficult how can you ask me demands he with an assumption of reproachful fondness that is rather overdone i do nevertheless with you then if i must put it in words says he lowering his tone to the softest whisper it is an eminent lover-like whisper it is a distinctly careful one too it is quite impossible for mrs conley sitting behind to hear it however carefully she may be attending it is well you cannot put your fortune to the touch says joyce quietly if you could disappointment alone would await you you mean asks he somewhat sharply that were it possible for me to commit such a vulgarity as to run away with any one you certainly would not be that one you are the very last man on earth i should choose for so mistaken an adventure let me also add says she turning upon him with flashing eyes though still her voice is determinately low and calm that you forget yourself strangely when you talk in this fashion to me the scorn and indignation in her charming face is so apparent that it is now impossible to ignore it being thus compelled to acknowledge it he grows angry beauclerk angry is not nice to do myself justice i seldom do that says he with a rather nasty laugh to forget myself is not part of my calculations i can generally remember number one you will remember me too if you please so long as i am with you says joyce with a grave and very gentle dignity but with a certain determination that makes itself felt beauclerk conscious of being somewhat cowed is bully enough to make one more thrust after all dysart was right says he he prophesied there be rain he advised you not to undertake our ill-starred journey of yesterday there is distinct and very malicious meaning in the emphasis he throws into the last word i begin to think mr dysart is always right says joyce bravely though her heart has begun to beat furiously that terrible fear of what they will say to her when she gets back of their anger their courteous anger their condemnation has been suddenly presented to her again and her courage dies within her dysart what will he say it strikes even herself as strange that his view of her conduct is the one that most disturbs her only beginning to think of it why i always understood dysart was immaculate the couldn't err sort of person one reads of but never sees you have been slow surely to gauge his merits i confess i have been even slower i haven't gauged them yet but then dysart and i were never much in sympathy with each other no one can understand that says she one can naturally with the utmost self-compliance i confess indeed 
with a sudden slight burst of vindictiveness, that I never liked Dysart. Idiotic sort of fool in my estimation, self-opinionated like all fools, and deucedly impertinent in that silent way of his, I believe, with a contemptuous laugh, he has given it as his opinion that there is very little to like in me either. Has he? We were saying just now he is always right, says Miss Cavanagh absently, and in a tone so low that Beauclerk may be excused for scarcely believing his ears. Eh? says he, but there is no answer, and presently both fall into a silent mood. Joyce because conversation is terrible to her, and he because anger is consuming him. He had kept up a lively converse all through the earlier part of the drive, ignoring the depression that only too plainly was crushing upon his companion, with a view to putting an end to it sentimentally, of any sort. Her discomfort, her unhappiness, was as nothing to him. He thought only of himself. Few men, under the circumstances, would have so acted, for most men, in spite of all the maids who so generously abuse them, are chivalrous and have kindly hearts, and indeed it is only a melancholy specimen here and there who will fail to feel pity for a woman in distress. Beauclerk is a melancholy specimen. End of chapter 24 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 25 of April's Lady This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. April's Lady by Margaret Wolfe Hungerford Chapter 25 Man, false man, smiling, destructive man, who breathes must suffer, and who thinks must mourn, and he alone is blessed, who ne'er was born. Oh, my dear girl, it is you at last, cries Lady Baltimore, running out into the hall as Joyce enters it. We have been so frightened, such a storm, and Baltimore says that mare you had is very uncertain. Where did you get shelter? The very warmth and kindliness of her welcome, the utter absence of disapproval in it of any sort, so unnerves Joyce that she can make no reply, can only cling to her kindly hostess, and hide her face on her shoulder. Is that you, Mrs. Connolly? says Lady Baltimore, smiling at mine hostess of the Baltimore Arms over the girl's shoulder. Yes, my lady, with a curtsy so low that one wonders how she ever comes up again. I made so bold, my lady, as to bring ye home Miss Joyce myself. I know Mr. Beauclerk to be a good support in himself, but I thought it would be a reasonable thing to give her the company of one of her own women folk besides. Quite right, quite said lady baltimore oh she has been so kind to me says joyce raising now a pale face to turn a glance of gratitude on mrs connolly why indeed my lady i wish i might have been able to do more for her and i'm sorry to say i'd to put her in a small most inconvenient room just inside all my own how was that asked lady baltimore kindly the inn so full then fegs twas that was the matter wid it said mrs connolly with a beaming smile crammed from cellar to garret ah the wet night i suppose just so my lady composedly 
and with another deep curtsey lady baltimore had given mrs conley into the care of the housekeeper who is an old friend of hers leads joyce upstairs you are not angry with me says joyce turning on the threshold of her room with you my dear child no indeed with norman very he should have turned back the moment he saw the first symptom of a storm a short wedding would have done neither of you any harm there was no warning the storm was on us almost immediately and we were then very close to falling then having placed you once safely in mrs conley's care he should have returned himself at all hazards it rained very hard said joyce in a cold clear tone her eyes are on the ground she is compelling herself to be strictly just to beauclerk but the effort is too much for her she fails to do it naturally and so gives a false impression to her listener lady baltimore casts a quick glance at her rain what is rain says she there was storm too a violent storm you must have felt it here no storm should have prevented his return he should have thought only of you a little bitter smile curls the girl's lips it seems a farce to suggest that he should have thought of her he now with her eyes effectually opened a certain scorn of herself in that he should have been able so easily to close them takes possession of her is his sister blind still to his defects that she expects so much from him has she not read him rightly yet has she yet to learn that he will never consider any one where his own interests comforts position clash with theirs you look distressed tired i believe you are fretting about this says lady baltimore with a kindly bantering laugh don't be a silly child nobody has said or thought anything that has not been kindly of you did you sleep last night no i can see you didn't there lie down and get a little rest before luncheon i shall send you up a glass of champagne and a biscuit don't refuse it she pulls down the blinds and goes softly out of the room to her boudoir where she finds beauclerk awaiting her he is lounging comfortably on a satin fauteuil looking the very beau ideal of pleasant careless life he makes his sister a present of a beaming smile as she enters ah good morning isabel i'm afraid we gave you rather a fright but you see it couldn't be helped what an evening and night it turned out by jove i thought the waterworks above were turned on for good at last and for ever we felt like the babes in the woods abandoned lost poor dear miss kavanagh i felt so sorry for her you have seen her i hope his face has now taken the correct lines of decorous concern she is not over fatigued she looks tired depressed said lady baltimore regarding him seriously i wish norman you had come home last evening what and bring miss kavanagh through all that storm no you could have left her at falling i wish you had come home why with an amused laugh are you afraid i have compromised myself i was not thinking of you i am more afraid with a touch of cold displeasure of your having compromised miss kavanagh there are such things as gossips in this curious world you should have left joyce in miss connolly's safe keeping and come straight back here to be laid up with rheumatism during the whole of the coming winter oh most unnatural sister what is it you would have desired of me you show her great attention all this summer says lady baltimore i hope i showed a proper attention to all your guests you were very specially attentive to her 
to miss kavanagh do you mean with a puzzled air ah well yes perhaps i did give more of my time to her and to miss maliphant than to the others ah miss maliphant one can understand that says his sister with an intonation that is not entirely complimentary can one here is one who can't at all events i confess i tried very hard to bring myself to the point there but i failed nature was too strong for me good girl you know but er awful we were not discussing miss maliphant we were talking of joyce icily ah true as if just awakening to a delightful fact and a far more charming subject for discussion it must be allowed well and what of joyce you call her joyce be human norman says lady baltimore with a sudden suspicion of fire in her tone forget to pose once in a way and this time it is important let me hear the truth from you she seems unhappy uncertain nervous i like her there is something real genuine about her i would gladly think that do you know she leans towards him i have sometimes thought you were in love with her have you do you know so have i with a frankness very admirable she is one of the most agreeable girls of my acquaintance there is something very special about her i'm not surprised that both you and i fell into a conclusion of that sort am i to understand by that just one thing i am too poor to marry with that knowledge in your mind you should not have acted towards her as you did yesterday it was a mistake believe me you should have come home alone or else brought her back as your promised wife ah what a delightful vista you open up before me but what an unkind one too says mr beauclerk with a little reproachful uplifting of his hands and brows have you no bowels of compassion you know how the charms of domestic life have always attracted me and to be able to enjoy them with such an admirable companion as miss kavanagh are you soulless utterly without mercy isabel that you open up to me a glorious vision such as that merely to taunt and disappoint me i am neither joyce or nor miss maliphant says lady baltimore with ill-suppressed contempt i wish you would try to remember that norman it would spare time and trouble you speak of joyce as if she were the woman you love and yet would you subject the woman you love to unkind comment if you cared you would not have treated her as ah if i did care for her interrupts he well don't you sternly she has risen and is looking down at him from the full height of her tall slender figure that now looks taller than usual oh immensely declares mr beauclerk airily my dear girl you can't have studied me not to know that as i have told you i think her charming quite out of the common quite that will do shortly you condemn me says he in an aggravated tone that has got something of amused surprise in it yet you know you of all others how poor a devil i am so poor that i do not even permit the idea of marriage in my head perhaps however you have permitted it to enter into hers says lady baltimore oh my dear isabel with a light laugh and a protesting glance do you think she would thank you for that suggestion you should think you should think said lady baltimore with some agitation she is a very young girl 
she has lived entirely in the country she knows nothing nothing throwing out her hand she is not awake to the inquiring lying falsity with a rush of bitter disgust that belongs to the bigger world beyond the terrible world outside her own quiet one here she is quiet here isn't she says beauclerk with admirable appreciation pity to take her out of it eh and yet so far as i can see that is the cruel task you would impose on me norman says his sister turning suddenly and for the first time directly towards him well my dear what throwing one leg negligently over the other it really comes to this doesn't it that you want me to marry a certain somebody and that i think i cannot afford to marry her then it lies in the proverbial nutshell the man who cannot afford to marry should not afford himself the pleasures of flirtations says lady baltimore with decision no is that your final opinion good heavens isabel what a brow what a terrible glance if smiling you favor baltimore with this style of thing whenever you disapprove of his smaller action i don't wonder he jibs so often at the matrimonial collar you advise me to think just now think yourself my good isabel now and then and probably you will find life easier he is still smiling delightfully he flings out this cruel jib indeed in the most careless manner possible ah forget me says she in a manner as careless as his own if she has quivered beneath that thrust of his at all events she has had strength enough to suppress all signs of it think not of her i dare say she will outlive it but of yourself what would you have me do then demands he rising here and confronting her there is a good deal of venom in his handsome face but lady baltimore braves it i would have you act as an honorable man says she in a clear if icy tone you go pretty far isabel very far even for a sister says he presently his face now white with rage a moment ago i gave you some sound advice i give you more now attend to your own affairs which by all account require looking after and let mine alone he is evidently furious his sister makes a little gesture toward the door your taking it like this does not mend matters she says calmly it only makes them if possible worse leave me end of chapter twenty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twenty six of april's lady this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c april's lady by margaret wolf hungerford chapter twenty six polonius what do you read my lord hamlet words 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 she sighs heavily as the door closes on her brother a sense of weakness of powerlessness oppresses her she has fought so long and for what is there nothing to be gained no truth to be defended anywhere no standard of right and wrong are all men all base selfish cowardly dishonorable her whole being seems aflame with the indignation that is consuming her when a knock sounds at the door there is only one person in the house who knocks at her boudoir door 
to every one servants guests child it is a free hand to her husband alone it is a forbidden ground come in says she in a cold reluctant tone i know i shall be terribly in your way says baltimore entering but i must beg you to give me five minutes i heard beauclerk has returned and that you have seen him what kept him now lady baltimore who a moment ago had condemned her brother heartily to his face feels as her husband addresses her a perverse desire to openly contradict all that her honest judgment had led her to say to beauclerk that sense of indignation that was burning so hotly in her breast as baltimore knocked at her door still stirs within her but now its fire is directed against the latest comer who is he that he should dare to question the honor of any man and that there is annoyance and condemnation now in baltimore's eyes is not to be denied the weather returned she shortly by your tone i judge you deem that an adequate excuse for keeping miss kavanagh from her home for half a day and night there was a terrible storm says lady baltimore calmly the worst we have had for months if it had been ten times as bad as he should in my opinion have come home the words seemed a mere repetition to lady baltimore she had indeed used them to beauclerk herself or some such a few minutes ago yet she seemed to repudiate all sympathy with them now on such a night as that i hardly see why joyce was with an old friend mrs conley was once a servant of her father's and he should have left her with the old friend and come home again her own argument and again perversity drives her to take the opposite side the side against her conscience society must be in a very bad state if a man must perforce encounter thunder rain lightning in fact a chance of death from cold and exposure all because he dare not spend one night beneath the roof of a respectable woman like mrs conley with a girlfriend without bringing down on him the censures of his entire world you can it appears be a most eloquent advocate for the supposed follies of any one but your husband nevertheless i must persist in my opinion that it was to put it very charitably indeed inconsiderate of your brother to study his own comfort at the expense of his girlfriend i believe that is your way of putting it isn't it yes immovably she has so far given way to movement however that she has taken up a feather fan lying near and now so holds it between her and baltimore that he cannot distinctly see her face as for the world you speak of it will not judge him as leniently as you do it can talk no one bitterly is as good a witness of that as i am but seldom coldly without reason and no one is a better witness of that than you are that is what you would say isn't it put down that fan can't you with a touch of savage impatience are you ashamed to carry out your argument with me face to face ashamed lady baltimore has sprung suddenly to her feet and sent the fan with a little crash to the ground oh shame on you to mention such a word am i to be forever your one scapegoat now take another one i beseech you says baltimore with that old queer devilish mockery on his face that was never seen there until gossiping tongues divided him from his wife here is your brother actually thrown to you as it were surely he will be a proof that i am not the only vile one among all the herd 
if nothing else, acknowledge him selfish, a man who thought more of a dry coat than a young, a very young, girl's reputation. Is that nothing? Oh, consider, I beseech you. His bantering manner, in which there was so much misery that it should have reached her, but does not, grows stronger every instant. Even a big chill from the heavens above would not have killed him, whereas we all know how a little breath from the world below can kill many a oh i you can talk 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 says she that late unusual burst of passion showing some hot embers still but can words alter facts she pauses a sudden chill seems to enwrap her as if horrified by her late descent into passion she gathers herself together and defies him once again with a cold look why say anything more about it she says we do not agree on this subject at least we should says he hotly i think your brother should not have left us in ignorance of miss kavanagh's safety for so many hours and you with a sneer who are such a marionette for propriety should certainly be prepared to acknowledge that he should not have so regulated his conduct as to make her a subject for unkind comment to the county badly looking at her deliberately as you think of me i should not have done it no says she in a cruel and unmistakable insulting monosyllable and bearing no other word with it is more detestable to the hearer no he says loudly sneer as you will my conscience is a rest here so i can defy your suspicions ah there says she my dear creature says he we all know there is but one villain in the world and you are the proud professor of him as a husband permit me to observe however that a man of your code of honour and of mine for the matter of that but i forget that honour and i have no cousinship in your estimation would have chosen to be wet to the skin rather than imperil the fair name of the girl he loved has he told you he loved her not in so many words then from what do you argue my dear i have told you that you are too much for me in an argument i a simple onlooker have judged merely from an everyday observance of little unobtrusive facts if your brother is not in love with miss kavanagh i think he ought to be i speak ignorantly i allow i am not like you a deep student of human nature if too he did not feel it his duty to bring her home last night or else to leave her at falling and return here himself i feel to sympathize with him i should not have so failed her oh but you says his wife with a little contemptuous smile you who are such a paragon of virtue it would not be expected of you that you should make such a mistake she had sent forth her dart impulsively sharply out of the overflowing fullness of her angry heart and when too late when it has sped past recall perhaps repents the speeding such repentances when felt too late bring vices in their train the desire for good when chilled turned to evil the mind never idle if departed from the best leans inevitably towards the worst angry with herself her very soul embittered within her lady baltimore feels more and more a sense of passionate wrong against the man who had wooed and won her and sown the seeds of gnawing distrust within her bosom baltimore's face has whitened his brow contracts what a devilish unforgiving thing is a good woman 
says he with a reckless laugh that's a compliment my lady take it as you will what are your sneers to outlast life itself is that old supposed sin of mine never to be condoned why say it was a real thing instead of being the myth it is even so a woman all prayers all holiness such as you are might manage to pardon it lady baltimore rising walks deliberately toward the door it is her usual method of putting an end to all discussions of this sort between them of terminating any allusions to what she believes to be his unfaithful past the past that has wrecked her life as a rule baltimore makes no attempt to prolong the argument he has always let her go with a sneering word perhaps or a muttered exclamation but to-day he follows her and stepping between her and the door bars her departure by heavens you shall hear me says he his face dark with anger i will not submit any longer in silence to your insolent treatment of me you condemn me but i tell you it is i who should condemn do you think i believe in your present attitude towards me pretend as you will even to yourself in your soul it is impossible that you should give credence to that old story false as it is old no you cling to it to mask the feet you have tired of me let me pass not until you have heard me with a light but determined grasp of her arm he presses her back into the chair she has just quitted that story was a lie i tell you before our marriage i confess there were things not credible to which i plead guilty but oh be silent cries she putting up her hand impulsively to check him there is open disgust and horror on her pale severe face before before our marriage persists he passionately what do you think there is no temptation no sin no falling away from the stern path of virtue in this life are you so mad or so ignorant as to believe that every man you meet could show a perfectly clean record of i cannot i will not listen interposes she springing to her feet white and ignorant there is nothing to hear i am not going to pollute your ears says he with a curl of his lip pray be reassured what i only wish to say is that if you condemn me for a few past sins you should condemn also half your acquaintances that however you do not do for me alone for your husband you reserve all your resentment what are the others to me what am i to you for the matter of that with a bitter laugh if they are nothing i am less than nothing you deliberately flung me aside all because why look here moving toward her in an uncontrollable agitation say i had sinned above the galleons say that lie was true say i had out hooded herod in evil courses still am i past the pale of forgiveness saint as you are have you no pity for me in all your histories of love and peace and perfection is there never a case of poor devil of a sinner like me being taken back into grace absolved pardoned to rave like this is useless there is no good to be got from it you know what i think what i believe you deceived wronged let me go cecil before before repeats he obstinately what that woman told you since i swear to you was a most damned lie i refuse to go into it again 
she is deadly pale now her bloodless lips almost refuse to let words go through them you mean by that that in spite of my oath you still cling to your belief that i am lying to you his face is livid there is something almost dangerous about it but lady baltimore has come of too old and good a race to be frightened into submission raising one small slender hand she lays it upon his breast and with a little haughty upturning of her shapely head pushes him from her i have told you i refuse to go into it says she with superb self-control how long do you intend to keep me here when may i be allowed to leave the room there is distinct defiance in the clear glance she casts at him baltimore draws a long breath and then bursts into a strange laugh why when you will says he shrugging his shoulders he makes a graceful motion of his hand toward the door shall i open it for you but a word still let me say if you are not in too great a hurry christianity now my fair saint so far as ever i could hear or read has been made up of mercy now you are merciless would you mind letting me know how you reconcile one you perversely mistake me i am no saint i do not coldly profess to be one i am no such earnest seeker after righteousness as you maliciously represent me all i desire is honesty of purpose and decent sense of honor honor that makes decency that is all for the rest i am only a poor woman who loved once and was how many times deceived that probably i shall never know her sad sad eyes looking at him grow suddenly full of tears isabel my meeting with that woman that time vehemently in town was accidental i it was the merest chance don't says she raising her hand with such a painful repression of her voice as to render it almost a whisper i have told you it is useless i have heard too much to believe anything now i shall never i think very sadly believe in any one again you have murdered faith in me tell this tale of yours to someone else someone willing to believe too with a terrible touch of scorn lady swansdown for example why do you bring her into the discussion asks he turning quickly to her has she heard anything that scene in the garden that now seems to fill him with self-contempt was a bêtise it was and what did it amount to nothing lady swansdown he is honestly convinced cares as little for him as he for her and at this moment it is borne in upon him that he would give the embraces of a thousand such as she for one kind glance from the woman before him i merely mentioned her as a possible person who might listen to you with a slight lifting of her shoulders a mere idle suggestion you will pardon me saying that this has been an idle discussion altogether you begin by denouncing my brother to me and now you have ended by denouncing your husband to me an idol a beginning as an end surely still to go back to beauclerk i persist in saying he has behaved scandalously in this affair he has imperiled the poor charles good name you can imperil names too says she turning almost fiercely on him lady swansdown i suppose says he with a bored uplifting of his brows the old grievance is not sufficient then you must have a new one i am afraid i must disappoint you lady swansdown i assure you 
cares nothing at all for me and i care just the same amount for her since when since the world began if you want a long date what a liar you are baltimore says his wife turning to him with a sudden breaking out of all the pent-up passion within her involuntarily her hands clench themselves she is pale no longer a swift hot flush has dyed her cheeks like an outraged insulted queen she holds him a moment with her eyes then sweeps out of the room end of chapter twenty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c